start recording. Here we are. We are reading Peter Atiyah's Outlive book together. Uh, this week we are reading chapter four. We're not going to read the whole thing. We probably could. It's not a very long chapter. What is it? Like maybe seven, eight pages or something like that. And I got to tell you, straight out of the gate, this is a very boring chapter. There was really nothing in this chapter that I uh, took away. I mean, it was... So, I mean, let's try to find some value in it. There's a few things that I highlighted. Um, the, chat, the title of the chapter is Centarians, uh, subtitled, The Older You Get, The Healthier You Have Been. And so, I'm, again, I'm, I'm, we are not going to read all of this. If you want to join us, go ahead and read it for yourself. Um, there's a lot of anecdotes about all these old people who talk about, I just live long on whiskey and cigars, and I'm 110 years old, you know, and it's like, and hey, I, blah, 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 blah. It's like all the confusion. They can't get any good data in the scientific world because all the, they, first of all, there's no studies that, that you know, span more than 100 years uh, ever. So they can't know all the controls and all that stuff. So they can't have a true scientific study. So they, so he does kind of dance around all of that problem and is like, well, what can we learn from these, you know, old folks who live really long? What's going on? And uh, in a nutshell, they end up they end up concluding that it's a it's about genetics. Surprise, surprise. And really, the only interesting thing is that you can actually change your genetics. And it's something called genetic expression. So that, that is the most interesting thing in this chapter that I want to talk about for a bit. And I, again, as, as I'm doing a podcast, I'm commenting on the, on the stuff I've read and giving my feedback about it, um, not being an MD, of course. Uh, and so we're going to go with that. Um, and I mean, so let, I'll start by reading one of them. Uh, British World War II, vet, British World War II veteran Henry Allingham attributed his own 113-year lifespan to quote cigarettes, whiskey, and wild, wild women. It's a shame I never met the adventurous French woman Jean Clamet, who joked, "I've never had even one wrinkle, and I'm the I've only had one wrinkle, and I'm sitting on it." She rode her bicycle till she was 100 and kept smoking until the age of 117. Perhaps she shouldn't have quit because she died five years later at. 122, making her the oldest person to ever have lived. Um, so, you know, Peter mentions that we yearn for some sort of secret to living long. What's your secret? Why are you living so long? And spoiler alert, there's no secret. These people just had the genetics that allowed them to live longer. So even if they had done, I mean, short of like some other things, right? So here we go. It says, if anything, the centurion males in the study were less likely to have exercised regularly at age 70 than age, than, than age matched controls, and many were overweight for such healthy lifestyles. Oh, yeah, there's kind of an interesting statistic here about men and women living longer, uh, women living longer. And, but it's interesting because the men who live longer tend to live really, really long. And the thinking is something like that the men were more susceptible to the horsemen and to risk un during the period of these studies, you know, working in the coal mines or whatever. Um, say what you want about, you know, equal rights and stuff, but you don't see many women coal miners. There definitely were, and they definitely were capable of it. There just weren't that many of them. And so statistically, we end up with people, the men that survived past a certain age end up lasting a lot longer. Uh, than the rest of their average males because they made it past the point. And uh, the women, according to this, are, are did not have uh, the same amount of risk or a different type of risk. Um, he talks about, you know, joining the, the, the super centarian club if you're over 110 and blah, blah, blah. Um, okay, so all of this stuff about being old, and it says, but we are interested in a slightly different question. Why are some people just able to blow past the 85-year-old mark like it wasn't even there? I mean, we all want to know that, right? And I, I mean, I, I think the reason I was disappointed by this chapter is they sets up this question, ooh, we're going to get the secret to living past 85, and the answer is kind of meh. Let's get to it. Um, this is the part where I post all the importance on detailed family history, blah, blah, blah. Because the problem is more relevant, can we 
through our behavior, somehow reap the benefits of the centurions for free via their genes. Or put more technically, can we mimic the centurion's phenotype? There's a word. P-H-E-N-O-T-Y-P-E. Phenotype. The physical traits that enable old people, centurions, to resist disease and survive for so long. So if we lack the genotype, can we at least mimic the phenotype? So phenotype is physical. Genotype, you can't change. Phenotype, you can Is it possible to outlive our own life expectancy if we are smart and strategic and deliberate about it? If the answer to this question is yes, as I believe it is, then understand the inner workings of these lottery winners is important for longevity. A deeper look into the data from multiple large centurion studies worldwide reveals a more hopeful picture. While it's true that many centurions exist in a somewhat fragile state, the overall mortality rate for Americans age 100 and older is a staggering 36%. Meaning that if grandma's 101, she has about a 1 in 3 chance of dying within the next 12 months. <laughs> I, that's, I don't know why I'm laughing. It's like, as soon as you get 100, it's like, damn, I have a 1 in 3 chance of dying. This Let me flip a coin with three, you know, sides. There's no such thing, but you know what I mean. Uh, digging further, we see that the oldest of the old... Uh, wait, what? Die from pneumonia and other opportunistic infections. COVID comes to mind. And a few centurions such as Madame Calment, Calment really do die from what we used to call old age. But the vast majority of these old folks succumb to diseases of aging. The horsemen. Do you remember the horsemen from last week? Can you name them? Stop the video and see, or pause the, pause the podcast and see if you can name them. What are the horsemen? What are the horsemen of, of death? <laughs> Just like the rest of us. The critical, the crucial distinction, the essential distinction, is that they tend to develop these diseases much later in life than the rest of us. And if they develop them at all, we're not talking about two or three or even five years later. We're talking about decades. According to the research from the Boston University, who runs a new who run the New England Centurion study? One of five people in the general population will have received some type of cancer diagnosis by the age of 72. One in five of us, my friends, are going to get cancer by 72. So there. And cancer is one of the horsemen. Uh, among centurions, that one in five threshold is not reached until age 100. Nearly three decades later, they don't even start getting cancer until 100 years old. What the hell? Uh, among centurions, I perceived is reached only at age 92. The same pattern holds for bone loss, osteoporosis, and other things like that. Strike centurions 16 years later than, on, than average, as well as stroke, dementia, hypertension. Centurions succumb to these conditions much later, if at all. Okay, we get it. Centarians are awesome, even if they drink whiskey and do wild, wild women or whatever the hell. I mean, let's get to the point here. He, Peter Atia likes to give all the backstory and stuff, so that's fine. I kind of want to get to the point, though. So, uh, oh, here's the whole thing about weeding out the, the frail men in the population. Uh, the fact that female centarians outnumber males by at least four to one the men generally scored higher in both cognitive and functional tests. So if the men live longer, they tend to be healthier than the older women, even though the more women live older. Uh, this might seem like a paradox at first, but since women live, clearly live longer than men on average, uh, Pearls, this scientist, believes that there is kind of a selection process at work because men are more susceptible to heart attacks and stroke beginning in middle age, while women delay their vulnerability by a decade or two and die less often from these things. This tends to weed out the frailer individuals from the male population so that only those males remain with relatively robust health, even though they make it so when they make it into their 100th birthday. While women tend to be able to survive for longer with age related disease, even though they have them. Pearls, this scientist, describes this as the, quote, double-edged sword, and that women live longer but tend to have poorer health when they get older. 
The men tend to be in better shape, he said. The authors didn't measure this, but my hunch is that they may have something to do with men having more muscle mass on average, which is highly correlated to longer lifespan and better function. Um, But even if they are not in such great shape in their 11th decade, these individuals have already enjoyed many years of extra healthy life compared with the rest of the population. The health span, as well as the lifespan, has been extraordinarily long. What's even more surprising is that Pearl's group has also found that the supercentarians and the semi-supercentarians, ages 105 to 109, actually tend to be in even better health than the garden variety 100-year-olds. Holy cow. These are the super survivors. And at those advanced ages, lifespan and health span are pretty much the same. As Pearl's colleagues put it in the paper title, the older you get, the healthier you have been. The other day someone said that they, I don't know how they figure this, but they they said, you're like a six-year-old in a 30-year-old body, or the reverse of that or something. And I, I do feel like my all that good, clean Mormon living definitely saved me some years. Um, I'm making up for it, though, really fast. <laughs> Whiskey, cigarettes, and wild, wild women, which all of which I did on Friday night. <laughs> if you want to actually participate in that, you can go watch my VOD. I posted all seven hours of it to YouTube uh, where I got adopted by a bicycle messenger gang after the critical mass ride in Charlotte. And I got to hang out and do the booty loop on my first fixie ever. I was so happy. Oh, man, I was absolutely ecstatic. Put my life in danger in multiple ways. <laughs> riding with traffic, riding against traffic, riding with drunk people, riding under the influence. I mean, and riding a fixie. So anyway, it's really, it was really, really fun. So if you ever want to tune in for that. Uh, these are people who have been, okay, in mathematical terms, the centurion's genes have brought them a phase shift in time. That is, the entire lifespan and hillspan curve has been shifted by a decade or two or three. Not only do they live longer, but these people have been healthier than their peers their entire life and biologically younger than them for virtually all of it. Um talks about the marginal decade and the bonus decade. We talked about that two weeks ago. Medicine 3.0 is to help people live longer by picking an okay. So this is where genes come in. The longevity genes that most of us don't have because we failed to pick the right parents. But if we can identify specific genes that centurions have, perhaps we can reverse engineer a phenotype. Phenotype being like a physical type. It gets kind of interesting because as much as I don't understand the genetics of this, he, 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 I'm jumping ahead here, but he gets near the end of it. He says that through regular uh, exercise after six months, you can basically change your genetic footprint, genetic footprint, which caught me very much off guard. So I'll just keep reading. Uh, so why are longevity diseases so elusive? Why are centurions so rare in the first place? Regular exercise. Good question. We're going to talk about that. Hold on a second. You might be saying, we've been taught all our lives that evolution and natural selection have relentlessly optimized us for billions of years, favoring beneficial genes and eliminating the harmful ones. So why do we still have genes that make us die early? The short answer is that evolution doesn't care if we live that long. <laughs> it just wants to make sure that we propagate and that's it. It's like, after that, we don't care. Natural selection is like, I don't care. As long as you're propagating, then, you know, you can eat your babies like the spiders do or your mate. As long as you procreate, then eh, that male is now potential nutrition. So eat him. <laughs> don't you love nature? Don't you just love nature? The, sh the short answer is evolution doesn't really care. Okay. So after that, everything goes sideways. Uh, to pick one obvious example, the genes responsible for male pattern baldness, <laughs> amen, uh, when we were young, our hair was full and glorious, helping us attract a mate and get married and have sex and all that jazz. But natural selection doesn't care about that for men after their 50s. It's like, no, we don't need our hair anymore. 
Uh-uh, because you're not going to procreate. So goodbye, hair, for men and some women, he says. Hair loss is not terribly relevant to longevity. Luckily for me, <laughs> he says Peter, he's also very bald like me. But the general phenomenon has explained why genes that might predispose someone to Alzheimer's disease are, or some other illness later in life do not vanish from the gene pool. So because Alzheimer's affects us so late in life that natural selection is like, yeah, we don't care about that. You, you, we, if you die, however you die, if you go crazy, who cares? As long as you procreated. That's all that matters. That's all that matters to nature. Did you procreate? Uh, one plausible theory holds that centurions live so long because they also possess certain other genes that protect them from the flaws in their typical genome. Anyway. All right, so next section. Uh, a handful of potential longevity genes have emerged in various studies, and it turns out that some of them are possibly relevant to our strategy. One of those potential individual genes yet discovered is related to cholesterol metabolism, glucose metabolism, and Alzheimer's disease. You might have heard of it. It's called APOE because of its known effect on Alzheimer's. It codes for a protein called blah, 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 blah. I don't think you care about that. Uh, the E2 variant of this same gene seems to protect its carriers against dementia. It also turns out to be very highly associated with longevity. He cites a study here and gives some background on that. Um... We will explore the function of this in more detail in Chapter 9, but for right now, it appears to play a role in delaying, if not, or not delaying, the onset of Alzheimer's. And APOE also shuts down cholesterol production, and we see this as a regular pattern, that a lot of these genetic things actually address multiple of the horsemen at the same time. So it keeps going on that. Uh, one other possible longevity gene has emerged in multiple studies. Uh, it's called FOXO, F-O-X-O-3, FOXO-3. I'll never forget that one. FOXO-3, FOXO-3. So FOXO-3 seems to be directly relevant to human ge ge uh, longevity. Um, let's see here. In 2008, Bradley Wilcox University of Hawaiian College reported that genetic analysis of participants in a long-running study of Hawaiian and Japanese ancestral men. They found it was strongly associated, FOXO3 was strongly associated with aging and longevity. Since then, several studies have found that various other long-lived populations also appear to have FOXO3 mutations, including Californians, New Englanders, Danes, Germans, Italians, French, Chinese, and American Ashkenazi Jews. Apparently, all those people live longer than the rest of us. I got to read that list again. Californians, New Englanders, Danes, Germans, Italians, French, Chinese, and American Ashkenazi Jews. They all live longer than everybody else. And guess what? They also all have more FOXO3. I can't stop saying that. It's so much fun. So FOXO3 belongs to a family of, quote, transcription factors, which regulate how other genes are expressed. That blows my mind. So, so this is where the whole genetic thing, you can actually change your genetics. He's going to get into that a little. I mean, everybody thinks you can't change your genetics. He's about to say, no, you actually can. Uh, you can do things that change the expression of your genetics, which is a weird concept, but he's kind of talking about it. I mean, let me read this again, because this one really caught me off guard. I was like, what the hell? FOXO3 belongs to a family of transcription factors which regulate how other genes are expressed, meaning whether they are activated or silenced. Now, I really like this. I kind of want to dig into this. My son, who's I got, you know, autistic, I've often said this. It's very controversial to say that um, some people may be genetically predisposed to autism. And I, I pers my personal belief is that there are certain environmental conditions that can trigger autism more easily than others. I mean, they they do have studies where people have quote unquote reversed autism by, you know, making environmental changes that affected the gut. And I assume that that means that they have done something d with these transcription factors, which have have caused those other genes, which would manifest as 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 autism or in this case, you know, Alzheimer's disease. It's interesting that they're related, right? Um, to to not take effect. So even though you're genetically predisposed, 
to have autism or to or, or Alzheimer's, you can do other things to silence those genes. Those are his words. Uh, that they there are certain things you can do to actively silence your genetic predisposition to whatever. And I mean, spoiler alert: exercise is one of them. Um, I think of it as rather as like a cellular maintenance department. Its responsibilities are vast, encompassing a vi wide variety of repair tasks, regulating metabolism, caring for stem cells, and various other kinds of housekeeping, including helping with disposal of cellular waste and junk. But this system doesn't do the heavy lifting itself, like the mopping, the scrubbing, the minor drywall repairs, and so on. Rather, that's what it does. Rather, it delegates the work to other, more specialized genes, its subcontractors, if you will. The FOXO3 is activated. When FOXO3 is activated, it in turn activates genes that generally keep our cells healthier. So it's, it seems to play an important role in preserving cells from becoming cancerous as well. So that's interesting. So, so even though FOXO3 is a genetic thing, it's, it's something... Um, it's something that we can control. Here's, here's where we start to see some hope because FOXO3 can be activated or suppressed by our behaviors. So you might feel sad because you're not a, quote, California, New England, or Dane, German, Italian, French, Chinese, or American Anaskazi Jew. If you're not one of those people who naturally has more FOXO3, then guess what? There's hope. Because some FOXO3 can be activated by our behavior. It seems weird that we could activate genetics through our behavior. That makes me, it makes me think of like, you know, mutant X superheroes. Because <laughs> you can literally change your genetic manifestation. That's what they're saying. So, for example, when we are slightly deprived of nutrients, this is so weird. Okay, this one, this one really caught me off guard. I'm saying, please explain more. So, for example... When we are slightly deprived of nutrients or when we exercise, I did not read that wrong. That's exactly what it says. So when we are slightly deprived of nutrients or when we are exercising, FOXO3 tends to be more activated. Beyond FOXO3, gene expression itself seems to play some important role, but it's poorly misunderstood. A genetic analysis of Spanish centurions found that displaying extremely youthful patterns of gene expression expression more closely resembled a control group of people in their 20s than an older group of octogenarians. Precisely how the centurions achieve this is not clear, but it may have something to do with FOXO3 or some other yet unknown governor of gene expression. So here we go again. You can have crappy genetics and you can change your genetic expression through behavior. I, I, don't, I don't understand the science. I'm just believing what they're telling me here. Uh, we still have more questions than answers when it comes to genetics behind, for extreme longevity, but at least we know more about this in a hopeful direction. While your genome is immutable, that means you cannot change it. If you're encoding, you know the word immutable means cannot be mutated, cannot be changed. Your genome is immutable. At least for the near future, gene expression can be influenced by your environment and behavior. For example, a 2007 study found that older people who were put on regular exercise programs shifted to a more youthful pattern of gene expression after six months. This suggests that genetics and environment both play a role in longevity and that it may be possible to implement interventions that replicate at least some of the centurion's good genetic luck. So if we weren't born with their genetic luck, we can cheat and we can do things that'll give us their genetic luck because we, but we have to work for it. And they didn't have to. They got a lot of it for free. Intermittent fasting comes to mind. Yes, we got some comments coming on there. Uh, every six months, apparently. Yeah, that's what they're saying, or at least for the near future. Gen I don't know all the details. I assume he's going to get into that a little bit more. Uh, only one more page here. So, um, and we'll talk about this a little bit. Uh, you got to keep at it. Absolutely. It's, it's consistency. Uh, the one thing that's been consistent <laughs> in this book <laughs> is consistency. If you if you think that you can fall off the wagon for a week or two or a month or even a weekend, 
you're mistaken. Your body doesn't respond unless it's consistent pressure in a positive direction. You know, fighting entropy, as we say. He says, I find it useful to think of centurions as a result of a natural experiment that tells us something important about longer living and living better. Only in this case, Darwin and Mendel, the Russian geneticists, are the scientists. The experiment entails taking a random collection of human genomes and exposing them to various environments and behaviors. The centurions possess the correct combination of genome X required to survive in environment Y. The experiment is not simple here, and many, and there are likely many pathways to longevity, genetic, and otherwise. Most of us obviously cannot expect to get away with some of these centurions' naughty behaviors, such as smoking and drinking for decades. But even if we don't, and in many, many cases shouldn't, imitate their tactics, centurions can nevertheless help inform our strategy. Their superpower is their ability to resist and delay the onset of chronic disease by one or two or three decades while also maintaining their relatively good health span. It's this phase shift that we want to emulate. Uh, here we go. So last quote here. Uh, this comes from Jay Olshansky, who studies the demo uh, demo demography of aging for the University of Illinois. He says, we're trying to attack heart disease, cancer, stroke, and Alzheimer's one disease at a time, as if somehow these diseases are all unrelated to each other, when in fact, the underlying risk factor for almost everything that goes wrong with us as we grow older, both in terms of disease, both in terms of diseases we experience and the frailty and disability associated with it, is related to the underlying biological process of aging. So Dr. J is suggesting all of the horsemen are related after a certain age. As we get older, that the age question, much of it is inter, is intertwined. It's not just, oh, hey, do this to prevent Alzheimer's. Do this to prevent this. Do this. It's like you can attack the whole thing by changing your genetic expression, for example, and you know, how do we do that? And, and I, I, the rest of the book is, is about that. I, I mean, he's already mentioned it, you know. Uh, in the next chapter, we look at one particular intervention, a drug that slows or delays the underlying biological process of aging as a, mecha as a mechanistic level. It may become relevant to our strategy as well, but for, for now, this means pursuing two approaches in parallel. We need to think about, uh, we need to think about very early disease-specific prevention, which we can explore in detail in the next few chapters, the horseman diseases, and we need to think also about the very early general prevention of all of them, targeting all the horsemen at once via common drivers and risk factors. These approaches overlap, as we'll see, reducing cardiovascular risk by targeting specific lipoproteins. Cholesterol may reduce Alzheimer's disease, for example, though not cancer. The steps we take to improve metabolic health and prevent type 2 diabetes are almost certainly will reduce the risk of cardiovascular disease, cancers, and high Alzheimer's simultaneously. Some types of exercise reduce risk for, uh, for chronic diseases, while others help maintain the physical and cognitive resilience of the centurions. Uh, in the end, I think that the centurion secret comes down to one word, resilience. They were able to resist and avoid cancer, cardiovascular disease, and all the rest, even while smoking for decades. They're able to maintain ideal metabolic health, often despite a lousy diet, and they resisted cognitive and physical decline long after their peers succumbed. But in this resilience is where we want to cultivate, just as Ali prepared himself to withstand, Ali prepared himself to withstand the fight against Foreman, reference to the first chapter. He prepared intel intelligently and thoroughly. He trained for a long time before the match, and he deployed the tactics from the opening bell. He could, have, he, could not, he, he could not have lasted forever, but he made it longer than Foreman and won. So, chapter five, which will be next week, Eat Less, Live Longer. I am super interested in this because there's been a lot of talk. I'm going to save my commentary for that for a little bit later. We, we're almost done with the podcast for today. I'm going to read, take some comments from the chat. I'm going to go read them right now. Uh, and I'm going, to, I'm going to save my speculation about that for next week. But I'm super interested in next week. I wasn't as interested this week. But next week, I'm super interested because there is raging debate on the Internet about whether fasting is good for you. And 
what does it mean to deprive? I mean, there was a hint of it this week. Your Foxo 3 is kicked up a notch if in, in the absence of nutrients. I'm like, what the hell does that mean? So we're going to, we're going to talk about that. We're going to talk about that next week. I have a feeling, I don't know. So, so, so that's my cliffhanger. I'm going to leave it there and we're going to read the chapter five next week. Let me get take some comments here after I turn my light off. If I can figure out how to turn my light, I'm trying my book light off. Um, let's see. Book has a lot of really good info. Uh, is another money grab. I don't, that's, I, I'm, I'm, I've kind of got, you know, money grab radar. Uh, and I, I researched Peter pretty heavily before I bought the book. I mean, I, I, I am not a fan of that type of thing, as you know. Uh, food still works right for you. Yeah. We could, people are giving a lot of ideas for exercise. Uh, I think that all came from somebody asking the question, what does regular exercise mean? Um, I don't want to jump ahead there and try to guess. Body regenerates after six months. That's the, after six months, their genetic expression changed to use his words. And I, that's the best I can give you. I don't know all the facts of details on that. Intervals, hit training, uh, tell us how to behave. <laughs> I'm really heavy in the strength department and pretty light in cardio. I think that most of us are going to find that, I mean, he, he's already said multiple times. I mean, there are so many studies that say one of the best ways for longevity and quality of life is increase your muscle mass going into old age. So from age 40 on, you should have a regular, and he gets in, I know he's got at least two chapters on this because it's a really big thing with Peter. Um, you don't want to go into old age with minimal muscle mass because it it's what's going to make your, because you can't generate more muscle after, after a certain point. It becomes real. I can attest to this right now. I, I used to do the workouts that I do, the yoga and the training and everything like that. And I, in my thirties, in my twenties and thirties, I would pack the muscle on like right away. I, was, I felt like I got Viking genetics or something. I don't know, but I, I used to be able to get really big, really fast. And <laughs> that's weird, but, and then, but these days, like I do the same sprints on the bike or something like that. And I'm sore for three days and I don't replace it. And it's probably because I have low T and a, there's a number of other actual, you know, biochemical reasons, I'm sure. But because I mean, I know people that do T therapy and they put, they keep putting the muscle on just as fast. It's probably the single greatest cause for a lack of putting on muscles. And, and actually one of the reasons I'm reading the book is because I am contemplating, my wife and I are actually contemplating the entire, um, you know, therapy stuff like, uh, you know, T therapy for men and, and they and as they age and, um, estrogen therapy for women as they age and, you know, to fight menopause and all this other stuff. I have, I don't have any informed by science, uh, information or conclusions or opinions on this particular thing. I have people are all over the board on this. And the one thing I really like about Peter is that he's so grounded in science, right? So, so I'm looking forward to reading about those things. That's actually one of the reasons I got the book is because I am just trying to decide if, if, if the benefits outweigh the negative of doing things like tea therapy in old age, uh, or if it's just an excuse for old guys to pump steroids, you know, cause it's also that, right. Uh, so anyway, so that, but strength training in general, you should be doing it. And they, I've, I've, I've heard over and over and over again from qualified people that, that doing some kind of strength training twice a, twice a week is pretty much mandatory for anybody over 30, 40, for everybody. You should be constantly building all areas of your musculature. And the problem I've been having, this is why I added yoga back, is I was, I was doing all the cycling and all my upper body was, was just languishing. It wasn't doing anything. And I got to tell you, after the first session of Ashtanga last week, I was sore. My entire core was sore. My back was sore. My upper arms, my upper pecs, triceps and everything. So, so people say yoga is for wimps. I'm like, oh, really? <laughs> tell that to Tony Horton, <laughs> the guy who invented P90X, the guy who invented high intensity training. Um, just basic running at the moment. Yep. I think, I think you have to have some level of cardio. Um, yeah. 
Uh, lots of other comments here. Uh, yeah, green tea, dark chocolate, apple cider vinegar are my hedge against the horsemen. Yeah, yeah, I mean, I, I'm not so sure it's going to come down to eat this, don't eat that. I think that's going to be more of a combination of things. And that's that's kind of where it's going, I have a feeling. Um, exercising regularly with dumbbells, yes. Um, you can't leave cardio out, though, either, because that's heart health. Although, if you overdo cardio, I just saw this. There's the GCN guys. He went in and got tested. They end up getting, their valves get worn out. There's two risks to, to really high-performing endurance athletes. One of them is AFib, which is random fibrillations in your heart, which can kill you. And it's, it's increased by people who are ex excessively endurance athletes. The other thing that endurance athletes have, they all have, and I kind of want to get tested, is they have um, heart valves that are overly used, so they start to leak and stuff. I'm, I'm really horribly paraphrasing that. But if you want to see that, the GCN guys, they go get tested for it, and they actually do a, an x-ray of the heart, and they show that he has it. So Cy, so Cy has it. And... But he, I mean, you know, he's fine. He's like, no, it's totally manageable and everything. But it, this, this occurrence of this particular anomaly in the heart is, is greater among endurance athletes than others. So it's, a, it's not don't do endurance athlete. People hear these things and then they're like, oh, damn, I'm not going to go work out because I'm going to have this thing. And then they end up putting on 50, 60 pounds of adipose tissue and their muscles go to shit and they don't have any bone density increases because, you know, osteoporosis is fought off by running. Did you know that? Did you know stresses to the nerve tissues from running stimulate bone growth in your legs? So the same things that make your legs sore are the same things that stimulate bone growth because your body somehow tells itself, oh my God, this guy's running we don't want these bones. We need these bones to be stronger. You th it's not that the bones are stretching. It's that the nerves around the bones are being activated, and that's telling the bones to keep putting on uh, you know, bone density. And so that's why running, as hard as it is, running, running and, and lifting and things like that, they, but running in particular, is really good for increasing, for fighting off osteoporosis. Because it, it's as long as you don't starve yourself, there's so many women, skinny women who starve themselves and they end up having their bones break. When I was a triathlete, that was a really bad problem. There were a lot of women that were having bone breaks because they weren't feeding their body. They weren't training properly and they were overtraining and they were sapping the bone density from their bones. And, and then their legs were breaking at 30 because so you got to be, you know, you got to you got to have a well-rounded approach if you're going to do any of this. Anyway, um. Your grandfather lived to be 101. He was a bitter, angry man his whole life. <laughs> he only got to mention in his last year. Wow. A short, lean, muscular farmer acti and actively wished for his death in his final years. <laughs> uh, yeah. I wonder how 100-year-old people think about death now versus when they were 70. Yeah. I wonder if people's epigenetic makeup changes over time, especially under environmental influences. I, I don't know. Uh, Chris says to my Mormon life from before, uh, I've never done anything official on that, but I, there's been plenty of ranting and raving about Mormon, my Mormon life, but I, it has never been kind of captured in one place. Uh, I, I believe that's it for the comments today. So I appreciate all your help, uh, getting through this and reading it. Um, another comment here. I've heard some professional cyclists have to get up in the middle of the night to cycle because the heart rate drops too low during sleep. They can die. I have not heard that. I have, I, I, I would be surprised if that's true. If you can find something about that. Yeah. Uh, thank you for getting into cycling. I cycling is a fantastic. We're going to talk a lot about exercise for particularly uh, sustainable exercise, the kind of exercise that, like I was a triathlete in my 20s and 30s and I loved it. One of the reasons I got into it is because I knew that that kind of, you know, stuff is the kind of thing you can do your whole life, particularly swimming. Swimming, I, I am dying to get back in the pool. They just barely got our pool back in order. And, and, and uh, But I'm dying to get back in the pool. So swimming is the thing, something you can do well into your 110 years. I mean, it's like, because it's so light on your body. It's it, you, you keep your body moving. Yoga is another one. People do yoga. I, I, there's a woman doing like a half pigeon pose and she's like, you know, 98. So 
you know, and yoga is, is not hard on your body. Running is one of the things you have to give up. Uh, Keanu Reeves, like two weeks ago, tweeted he can't run anymore. It's just one of the things he can't do. Lance Armstrong also can't run anymore. He, he's on his bike, but they can still bike, right? Um, I think, I, I also think you can probably dance. I've been dancing a lot lately, in case you didn't know. Last night, I, I could not. I had no energy. I'm so sorry. Everybody who tuned, tuned in last night to see me like shake my booty and all that because I sometimes do the right code. I did not. I could not. I was so tired. My wife and I went to go out on a date and you know that the night before that was kind of um, was kind of a fun one. So I I did not have it in me. I just fell right asleep. I am going to do yoga today though. Later today I'm going to I'm going to do some yoga. I'm going to do Shrimashtanga and I'm going to emphasize upper body strength. Uh, we're going to do half primary. And uh, when I do Ashtanga yoga, the reason I pick Ashtanga, Ashtanga yoga myself is because I know that Ashtanga yoga is working my the upper the parts of my upper body that I want and that I need to work out. The only thing it doesn't work out is your back. In fact, yoga in general does not work. You look at look at people who do yoga all the time. They do not have they and compare them to like the same type of people, same body weight who do climbing, right? They have no back yoga people in general. They have no back at all because they're never pulling. They're, they're never they're You're never doing pull-ups, right? So in my particular practice, I throw in, uh, some kind of P90X, you know, high intensity stuff, not high intensity, but I throw in some pull-ups usually. Uh, one or two assisted pull-ups with a chair or something on an incline or something. Because if you're not doing a pull-up, you're not working certain elements of your of your upper body. But other than that, Ashtanga works everything, including your organs, which is something most other exercise tech training uh, things do not do. Um, the Marichasana poses, which cause you to twist your core, uh, those are really good for your back as long as you don't overdo it, right? They're really good for your back. Um, talk to a uh, uh, somebody who dealt with old people in yoga during my yoga training. She that she was specialized in helping ex the extremely old do yoga, and she had two things to say. One, build a booty. Build a booty. She used to say. She goes, the most important muscles you're gonna have when you go into old age are your glute your gluteus maximus muscles because they keep you stable. They're your stabilizers. They keep you up. So she says, build a booty, and she's like, don't push your back, but make sure you move your back in every way possible. Your spine needs to move in every way possible every day. Otherwise, it'll, it'll kind of crystallize in one spot. And then, then you start to get the fusion of, of your spine. But if you move your spine in a safe way, if you move your spine in every way, that means twisting it both ways. That means going this way, you know, side to side. That means going front and back. If you move your spine to its, to its limit without pushing it, obviously I keep saying that because someone's going to do this and slip a disc. So you do it, you know, not just every day. She said, that was the other thing she said. That's what you need to do. Because the, the injuries that she sees in old people related to this is because as you age, you dry out. Like every part of your body dries out. Your cartilage dries out. Your, your, your discs in your back dry out. And as everything dries out, because you forget to drink too. You know, it's really crazy. It all comes together. And then as everything dries out, you get more brittle and it's, you're easier to break. And yoga is not just about touching your toes. It's about generating strength through, you know, downward dog is hard. It's hard to stay in downward dog for five seconds and do that five times in a row. You're going to build muscle. It might not be, you know, gym muscle, but you're going to definitely go, look at the yoga people. Look at the yoga girls. Look at their upper shoulders. Go look at my, the white pictures of my wife. Like when she was into yoga, her upper arms right here. So yoga builds all the, all the pretty muscles too, by the way, you know, all the ones that get seen when your shirt's off except for your biceps, but you know, you can do that with pull-ups. If you do pull-ups, it works your back and it works your, your biceps. So, uh, yeah. So yeah, that's, that's what I would say. Uh, the Pantani thing. Yeah. And you can, yeah, you can do some moves with resistance bands and stuff like that. But, but that, that woman who was certified in and spent every single day working with people in old age homes to regain their mobility uh, and to regain their muscle mass. Those were the two things she said, build a booty, 
build a booty and move your back in every direction that it can go every day. And both of those things are done with yoga. So if you're doing daily yoga, if you're doing daily yoga and you, you mix it up some days, you're doing, you know, a harder practice than another. You, you got, you got your longevity. And that's where that comment came from. Same thing with swimming, by the way. Swimming doesn't build a booty unless you're kicking a lot, but, but, um, it's still pretty good for you. Anyway, I could talk forever about these things. These things are, are fun to talk about. Um, he does have some other videos here that I'm dying to watch men's health and men's sexual health and men's, uh, women's sexual health. Those are always fun topics. <laughs> so we'll go look for that later. Until then, this is it for me for now. We will talk to you next week for uh, Peter Atia's Outlive. Make sure you go give Peter a like and a YouTube and listen to him yourself. Bye. Bye.